Detective Ken Maines here from Unsolved No More. Hey, you guys that have watched the channel know that I certainly would never endorse something that I didn't personally use. That's why I want to talk about factor meals because factor meals are definitely something that I use on my daily basis. Uh, the thing I like about factor meals, man, I'm telling you, hey, they're fresh and never frozen. And that is important to me for my diet. It's really easy to plate and get on the table. And also a third thing is the variety of stuff you get. And you know what I really like about it? And I didn't mention this is the shakes, the smoothies. I love them. This July, get factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh flavor packed meals delivered to your door, ready in two minutes. No prep, no mess. So head to factor75.com or click the link below and enter the code UNSOLVEDNM50 for 50% off your first box. Let me repeat that. Head to factor75.com or click the link below to get 50% off your first box when you enter the code UNSOLVEDNM50. Move the thin ghost of music in the spinet. I cannot say your seas, I cannot wander your hill lands, or your cornlands or your valleys ever again, nor share the battle yonder where the young knights of broken squadron rally. Only sit quiet while my mind remembers the beauty of fire from the beauty of embers. Welcome back to another edition of Exit Unsolved with me, your host, Ken Maines. Now, today, what we're going to talk about is a little known case out of Bowie, Maryland. And it's the death of 17 year old Donna Dustin. She was a white female um, who was found murdered in an abandoned gravel pit. Now, this is not uncommon to a lot of other cases that I have looked at, where you have a pretty young female who is at a party and something happens. You're going to hear in this case from a lot of people, and it's a testament to the effect that young Donna had on people. Donna Dustin is somebody that should never be forgotten. She joins a fraternity of young women who should never be forgotten. And these are the lost souls that we deal with here on earth because they've been snuffed out by somebody for some reason. And usually, it's a very selfish, self-serving reason. I like to say greed, sex, or revenge. In this case, which one is it going to be? Now you're going to hear from former law enforcement officers who worked Donna's case. I believe I started in 1998, 1997, 1998. It's right before the 25th anniversary, so that would have been 98. So I started, I was doing cold cases. Um, I think my first cold case was way back in the 80s. But uh, So we started looking at it and it started to be, you know, worthwhile to pour some time into it. So I ended up working the case until my retirement. 2013. We're going to hear from members of Donna's family. I saw a picture of her niece, uh, who I've never talked to or met. I've only seen pictures of her. This age, she looked exactly like this. And my grandmother and I were super close. And I think 
Our bond was like that because I reminded her so much of Donna. You're going to hear from private investigators and people who have a vested interest in this case. Why? Because it affects them. And so over the last two and a half years, we've been running down leads. Um, Bill and I have done a lot of interviews with people on the phone and on Facebook and through email. And I met with people in person. And I've gone back and forth with some of these people, really, that were interesting, I thought, over and over again. Who was there at the very end, whether, where they were at. And when something affects you, you do what you can to find out what the resolution is so you can move on with your life. A lot of these people can't do that. I know from experience, when you get in deep to an investigation and it becomes personal to you, it's very hard to ever get away from that. It sticks with you. You try. When you lay down at night, you try to think of anything but that. But the crime scene images will flash through your head. And then you'll have a question as to why her shoe was over there instead of over here where it should be. And when that happens, there's nothing more that you want but to find out the truth. So, that's where hopefully I can come in and I can help. Because, let me tell you what happens. When you become so invested in a case, you start coming up with your theories, your solutions. And then, everything sort of becomes tainted there. Because when you look at something, you are automatically thinking, it is a certain way because in your mind you have your gut feeling. You have what the evidence is telling you even though you know it isn't, it isn't fact because you're still searching for the answers. But there's still an unbiased there. And then you start looking at minute details that will pull you off course. Okay, It has nothing to do with it. But in your mind, you are going to make it try to make sense and tell you that it does. For an example, I had a murder suspect get a tattoo, a portrait of one of the victims. Hey, not, not uncommon because he was related, right? But it had the wrong date of death. And I honed in on that because I thought it was him. That's the smoking gun. He, he doesn't want to be reminded of the day he actually killed her. That's why permanently on his body, he purposely put a different date. You know what that is? That's an amateur. That was me, you know, 15, 20 years ago, looking at a case saying, I, I know it, and you're making the evidence fit your suspect instead of the suspect fitting the evidence, okay? Just, it's, it's not healthy. It's not how to do a good investigation, and it's good to have somebody who is not vested in it. And then you don't have to go down all the rabbit holes. And that's what we're going to do today on the Donna Dustin murder that happened November 16th 1973, when bell bottoms were in, people were listening to Leonard Skinner, Kiss, you know, what was on TV at the time. Um, I don't know, I was born in 1974. So this happened before I was born. But I hope to bring my experience and my, this is very important, non-biased look at the case. And when I did that, I might not be able to tell you a suspect's name. And if I could, I wouldn't. Because, again, those suspects have grown up, have families, and certainly 
stepped on it. Dustin didn't deserve this. And they need to be held accountable. I'm not saying that. That they don't. But their family never did nothing to Donna. You know, so I'm very hesitant to out somebody. And I, I don't think I've ever done it. And I don't plan on it. I just think it's irresponsible and it's not professional. But I can tell you what type of person would have committed this crime. I can tell you why it happened. And I can tell you what most likely transpired based off the evidence that I see. Now, sometimes police departments will hold back things and we'll get into that because I feel that they probably did or they tried to in this instance, in this case. But I seen something that bothers me and I feel that together and as a community, we can get people talking and keep Donna's Donna's case in the spotlight where it deserves to be. It should not be forgotten because of time. So let's get into it. Around midnight, Donna Dustin, 17 year old, attractive white female who is described as a fighter, but yet naive. She's described as trusting, yet a partier. She almost sounds like a female version of what I was as a teenager. And that struck me when I was going over her victimology and listening and reading about what people had to say about her. So around midnight on November 16th, 1973, she is on what we would call like a group date. And this group date does their thing. They go out and they, they come home. Now listen, I don't want to get into all the little details about things that don't matter. Okay? To me, the names of the people that she was on this group date with doesn't matter to me. They were her friends. Okay? So they did their thing. A timeline is very important. Yes, you want to know. 48 hours, 24 hours, you know, even further out than that sometimes. But what's important, I think, is to hone in on the unknown. And that's when that timeline shrinks. Okay, around 12, 1230, she's out on this group date. And in this group date, she's with a new boyfriend. She had a boyfriend in the past, and that's obviously somebody that you may want to look at, you certainly are going to interview past boyfriend, but when we get to the crime scene or if applicable, the body dump location, that will tell you, that'll tell you right then and there if it was the boyfriend or not. It really will. And it's very easy to determine that. So she goes on this group date and in this group date, she is with a new boyfriend, meaning it was their first date. He was younger. I believe he may have been 15. Danny O'Connor uh, had gone out with her. He was only like, I think, 15 or something at the time or 16. Okay. Now, Donna is there by herself. She has a friend that's staying with her, but her family isn't there. Her mom, her dad, her sibling. They are in Florida. Okay, this happened in Maryland. They're on vacation and they left their daughter there. Nothing wrong with that, especially in 1973. She's 17 years old. Uh, there's not a problem with that. But let me tell you a little quick tidbit. When I was 17 and my parents left me home alone and they went on vacation to Mexico, what do you think happened in my house? The same thing that's going to happen at Donna's house. There's going to be companionship. There's going to be partying. There's going to be teenage mischief. And that's what happens here. Donna and her new boyfriend 
can you really call him a boyfriend? He was there for one date and they arrive around 1.30 in the morning. Um, I, I think it's around 12.30. Let me back that up. It's probably around 12.30 they get dropped off. They had gone out that night. They come home. The chaperone drops Donna and the new boyfriend off at Donna's house around 12.30. But uh, they had gone back to her house and smoked uh, what he later found out was marijuana laced with PCP. The, they had sex there at the house. And she said she still wanted to go back out and party. He had to be home because he had to be at work at Pizza Wheel the next day. During that 12.30 to 1.30, 1.30 is when she ends up taking him home. There's an hour there. They have sex, consensual sex, but that is not what's alarming to me. That is normal behavior that I see. But what she does next, I think has implications directly correlating to her untimely death. And that is, she pulls out a bag of marijuana. Now, according to some accounts, she offers it to the new boyfriend, her date. We'll say her date. And he takes a hit off of it and he says it tastes funny. And then she says it is laced with PCP. So two things right there raise a red flag to me. One being she didn't tell him before he took a hit of that. Now when something is laced with anything, today a lot of times it's fentanyl and it can be certainly deadly. If it's laced with PCP, I've had dealings with PCP. I've actually fought a guy who was on PCP. Um, and let me tell you, I was hitting this guy with everything that I possibly could. And he was still running his mouth and not going down. And that's a whole story for another time. I've told it before. But that was my dealing with somebody on PCP. She didn't tell him this. He didn't smoke the rest of it. Now, how do we know that story? Because they interview this guy, and that's the story he gives. He's credible. He checks out. He's a 15-year-old kid. He, he, there's no reason not to believe him. She says, okay, I'm going to take you home because she wants to go back out to party. She's not done partying yet. Hindsight's 2020. 20. I mean, that's mistake number two. Mistake number one, smoking PCP. Okay. And she wasn't a druggie. I don't want you to get that image of her. She was a teenager in the early 70s where smoking marijuana was... It's not as prevalent as it is today, but in a certain subculture, maybe it was. She was described as she started to hang out with different crowds, a rougher type of crowd. She had offered him some pot, and he took a hit off the, you know, it was a rolled uh, marijuana cigarette, and he didn't like the taste of it. He said, there's something about this, and she said, yeah, well... Basically, it's laced with PCP. He didn't like the taste of it, and he said, "I don't, I don't do that stuff." And so, that was it. And um, now, do we know if she was into anything like that, or was this more like an experimental? Thing? Um, at this point in her life, she was kind of casually, recreationally using uh, okay. alcohol and marijuana. Um, the PCP thing—I don't know much about her use of that, but she did have in her possession some PCP. But her smoking of this, and then offering it to this date and not telling him what was in it is a red flag to me. So that happens. He takes one hit. He says, no, I don't want to, I got to get home. I got to work in the morning. And so she's like, okay, I'll take you home. So she takes him home and technically 
That is the last confirmed sighting of her until the next day around 9 a.m. when hunters find her nude body in this gravel pit. There's a Meyer Station Road right here on the right, but they blocked it off. And I think it was the late 70s, they closed the road down completely because it was so dangerous to go across the bridge. So right here on the right, that's Meyer Station Road. You go down about two blocks, make a left. You go on a dirt road, you go across a rickety wooden bridge. They go whatever across there and they dropped her on the left at the, uh, the old uh, gravel pits there. It was the old uh, trolley bed for the Baltimore, Washington, Annapolis trolley system that ran from Annapolis all the way to Baltimore and DC, the old tracks. And that particular property was known as Myers Station. And the owner of that property was Buzz Myers, who's deceased. And by his accounts, that was a real popular party place for many, many years, just crazy parties and people running around naked and screaming. And So think of an overview image of her body in this gravel pit. And let's, like on a VCR, you hit the rewind button. We're going to go back to 1.30 when he takes, when she takes her date home. The next thing that happens is something we investigators, we have now got to start assuming. And normally we don't like doing this, okay? But in a, an investigation where we are trying to find her whereabouts, how did she end up where she is, we have to assume some things. Now, please come to learn that there was a few parties that night. One of the parties allegedly had a hundred and something people and there was people in the front yard and this and that. We're gonna to go to the first location she hit, which was her house. So she would have turned around and left here and gone back down the express route again. So she would have come down here. And again, people knew there was all parties going here every weekend. And this was what, a, a five song. minute drive? Yes, according to witnesses and the media, there may have been over 100 people here. Passed out in the front yard, the backyard. This is it right here, this house. It's a blue one. Yep, this is where it was at the time where it lived. Now try to imagine all the cars parked on the street, 100 people at this small house, front yard, backyard, the noise, and maybe how often the police may have been called to this location. Now we believe she was parked somewhere out here in the front in her car. She had just got a new car. She only made like maybe one payment on it. And she was parked out here outside of her car talking with some of these boys that were here. And now this is within proximity of her home. It's not like it's 50 miles away or anything. What she tells her date, she's not done partying. She wants to go out and still have fun. We have to assume then that she more than likely went to one of these parties. So what do we have to do? We have to interview people at these various locations where parties were to try to figure out which one she was at. And when they do this, they get some different responses. Yes, she was here. No, she wasn't here. So right then and there, it's like the investigation kind of doesn't hit a wall, but everything now is assumptions. There's no more concrete, physical evidence she was here. But going back to her house, what are we looking for? Come on, somebody said it, her car. If she took her date home and she went to a party, her car should be, if she was killed, it should be at that party. Well, it wasn't. Her car was at her home. So now, although we assume that she was at a party and she most likely was, Somehow, she ends back to her home. 
So now we're looking at the time frame between 1.30 when he, she took her date home in the morning to 9 o'clock when her body is found. So we're, we're within this range when she ends up back at the house. Now, as an investigator, when you go into this house, what are some things that you are looking for? Well, you're, you want to look for anything out of the ordinary, such as a struggle. Meaning, you can have a struggle. You know, people get hung up on if something is not knocked off the wall, there wasn't a struggle. And that's not true. You know, if you're in a kitchen and you're strangling somebody on the kitchen floor, what are you really going to knock down? There was a struggle and the person died because they got choked out, but nothing is disturbed. Doesn't mean there wasn't a struggle. But in this case, they look and they don't see anything. They don't see a struggle. But what they do find is very telling. They find multiple beer bottles or beer cans, evidence of other people being there. Now this is significant because now, again, we have to assume and, in, and if there's evidence that comes to us that breaks our assumptions up, that's fine. But right now, we have to assume that, hey, she had people over. So if she was at a party, maybe some people there followed her home. She could have given them rides, right? She, they could have got in her car and went, but... It's also possible that she was followed. She invited people to her home is what, that's what the crime scene tells us. I mean, we don't know if that's a crime scene. It's, uh, we have a body dump location, which could be a crime scene too. But it's what her residence tells investigators. Now, there are some potential, very important clues there that I don't know. And what do I mean by that? Well, if I'm an investigator and I'm there and I see multiple beer cans and beer bottles, what a lot of times, especially in 1973, do you think would accompany drinking? Now, some of you said drugs, and yes, that's for sure. Cigarettes, simple thing is cigarettes. I would want to know, did Donna smoke? What brand? Did Donna smoke? And if you have different beer cans, beer bottles, and cigarette butts there, what is that? That's evidence. 1973, you ain't testing those cigarette butts for DNA, but you are in 2023. Would they have been smart enough to collect them? That I don't know. But that's still, take DNA out of the picture. Think just as an old-time investigator. Okay, there are marble light cigarette butts. Well, guess what? When I go and interview any suspect, any person, I'm going to be looking to see if they smoke and what brand they smoke. And if it's marble lights, guess what? Hey, I'm keeping him right here until I can roll him out. So I'm betting there's stuff that was found in that house that has not been released to the public. So Donna made it home, probably with company in tow. But now, how does she end up at a body dump location several miles from that, from her residence? And again, between 1.30 a.m. and 9 o'clock a.m. Well, let's jump to the crime scene or body dump location and see what it tells us. So. This is what we used to call the circle. But back then it was just a private resident. This is where we used to sit and hang out. So if you went back there now, can you just describe me a little bit what, the, what it yeah, like? Yeah, you go down a couple hundred yards uh, down this road and then you'll come to a clearing. Mm -hmm. 
you turn right at the clearing, there's a new building that, and then off to the right of that was the hill where you saw the uniform police car parked on the day she was discovered. And back up there, if you get on that right of way, it's just a flat, straight line. She was found about, I don't know, 100 yards down the road in, in the woods by about uh, you know, 100, 150 feet. We were able to triangulate it from photographs from 73. We were able to determine the, pretty much the exact spot where she was found. There's been a very heavy storm that came through. Um, I don't know, since uh, I've been active in the investigation, it totally wiped out. It was like a mini burst or a small tornado. So it's like totally, you know, the woods are reorganized. What are your thoughts on her being dumped back here? I'm pretty certain that uh, whoever uh, the person or persons was knew this area. And there was no way to determine whether she was brought back here by the Prince George's County side or by the this side, the Anne Arundel County side. Either way, the, the access was there then. You could drive right through from one to the other. So um, it was somebody that, it's not an area that, unless you were familiar with this or lived with this or even hunted back here, you wouldn't know this area or how to get to it. This is Bowie Race Track. Uh, it's changed. You actually even see the fencing for the track, and now it's blocked off. It's like uh, it's a different entrance, but okay, that's where I used to go in. This is the road that went behind the stables, behind the track, and this is the road that led down to the bridge that went across the other side where we were sitting at the, the blocked off gate. It's probably about a quarter of a mile back there from where we are, but it was just across the river, which is the line for the, the county. The only reason she was found as quickly as she was, it was the opening day of hunting season. And the two uh, men were back here hunting and they came across what they thought was a mannequin uh, because it was a totally nude looking figure, it ended up being Donna. Uh, so they went back and reported, reported it to Prince George's County, and they showed up, uh, I believe, the first on the scene, and Anne Arundel County came shortly after that. Donna is naked. First and foremost, what, what can we deduce from that now? I think it's very obvious it's a sex crime. Greed, sex, revenge. A lot of subcategories, but because she's naked, we can assume that it was a sex crime. Just off of that. Now, is it possible somebody was trying to rob her, put a gun to her head, took her clothes so she wouldn't flee? Sure, that's possible, but it's not probable. Somebody that thinks like that is somebody that will start going down rabbit holes when it is not necessary. Okay, just like all the places that Donna allegedly may have went after dropping her date off. We don't need to know all that. Okay, I don't need to know all that. I don't need to know that she went to this party and then she went to this party. But somebody there said that she wasn't there, but she was confirmed at this party. I don't care about any of that. Okay. Let's go back over here to the crime scene, to the body dump location, and let's analyze that and tell, let that tell us something. It's already speaking to us. It's telling us, hey, this is a sexual related crime. There might be some other indicators or motives in there, but in, at the surface, it's a sexually motivated crime or she wouldn't be naked. Think of the weather. It's November in Maryland. It's cold, especially at night. She, she ain't walking around naked. She's probably, she's going to have a coat. She, her shoes are missing. All these items are not there. That tells you something. What does it tell you? Well, it tells me more than likely that she was not murdered there. Now, there is a caveat to that. 
she could have been murdered in a vehicle. Sexually assaulted in a vehicle. And the clothing there. And she is found naked. I've never seen... Yeah, I've never seen a naked body of a victim and later it was found that the person took the time to gather up their clothes to get rid of. If it was done right then, right there at that scene. I've never seen that. Now, some have taken items as trophies, serial killers, serial offenders. But I don't think we have that here. So, again, I go back to, is it possible that there was a struggle in her house and something happened and nothing was knocked down? She was strangled and killed. And it could have happened there at the house and her body transported. Sure. But... Let's now look at the injuries to her body, her cause and manner of death to see if that matches that she could have been killed at her home and transport. So it's, she ha, she's beaten. She, her head is beaten very badly with three different objects or, or potentially three different objects but she's also stabbed now this is a big clue when you have multiple weapons being introduced into a conflict where somebody loses their life there is normally only one good reason for that and that is that there's more than one person now there's some exceptions to that meaning if it's a a weapon of opportunity meaning a fight escalates and a person grabs the closest thing let's say it's happening outside you start choking somebody and realize that that's not working or you become more and more angry because the person is not dying and you grab a weapon of opportunity, meaning what is close? Well, a rock. You smash him in the head with a rock um, and she dies. Well, now the coroner looks at her, the medical examiner, the pathologist, and they say, well, she has petechial hemorrhaging of her eyes. Her strap muscles around her neck are bruised. Um, but that's not what killed her. It was a blunt force object, more than likely a rock, which was found at the crime scene. There you have two weapons. And it's because they were weapons of opportunity. So she is stabbed. She is beaten about the head with a rock or a brick, according to what you'll hear later from one of the investigators. But it's something else that the investigator doesn't mention. Nobody mentions. The newspaper coverages don't mention it, except for one time in the very beginning and it's very disturbing. And I think this may have been something that the police were trying to leave out. Now, normally, if the police have sent me crime scene photos and uh, the police reports and they say, hey, please analyze this, do whatever you want with it, but don't, don't talk about this. I would, I would never do that. You know, I'm, I'm a man of my word. Uh, and I didn't get those instructions so I'm okay to talk about this because it's out there. It was in the newspaper, yet nobody mentions it. And what it is, is that, and it's so disturbing, that I believe the medical examiner, I know it was the medical examiner, said that 
she had a lug wrench inside of her. So what does that mean, first off? Does everybody know what a lug wrench is? You know, it's, um, you used to have tire irons. Well, a lug wrench is like just a section of that. It's, a, it's a, like a heavy pipe that you use to take the lug nuts off of your tires. When they say it was in her, she certainly didn't swallow it. I'm making an assumption here because of the type of murder that this is. This is a sexually motivated murderer, which means I don't believe that they are sticking a lug wrench down her throat, although they could. I believe that when he says a lug wrench was in her, they had inserted that lug wrench vaginally to young Donna Dustin. Um, I have certainly have seen this rage before when an object is inserted into a victim's anus or vagina. But when I see that, it makes me think of a certain type of offender, lone, singular offender. Yet the evidence here shows me that it was not a singular offender. So then I have to readjust what my knowledge is of this type of offender. Because not only are there multiple weapons used on Donna, there were two sets of boot prints, according to investigators, that was found, and I, they are found near Donna's body. That's the best I can say because I don't know where they were found in this gravel pit. Remember back to my Jennifer Hill case when the investigators removed Jennifer Hill's body and it had been raining and there was a perfectly preserved boot print under her body which was later matched to the offender. Could they be that lucky in this case? I don't know. But the offender, offenders, at least two, did leave boot prints. So now we've deduced a couple of things. We've deduced what type of murder this is. It is a sexually motivated crime. Two, that there are at least two offenders. Now, when I look at cases like this, I like to correlate them to past cases that I worked with or worked on. And in this particular case, I draw some strong correlations to Teresa Corley and the yogurt shop murders and both equally because Teresa Corley was at a party, was drinking, may have been, I believe, attempted sexually assaulted or sexually assaulted and then murdered. And she was, I believe, 17 as well. And then her body was found nude, down over a dump. Some of her clothes were alongside the road, I think. But um, the yogurt shop murder, more than one person, uh, sexual assault involved, and then murder, different weapons. Uh, certainly different types of guns indicating more than one person. So we've deduced that here. Now, when I said that I was going to adjust my, my thinking as to it not being a singular offender, evidence proves that it's not, what type of person are we looking for who would do this? Well, I think we can deduce a lot of things. Number one, that more than likely that the offenders were at a party somewhere within that vicinity that night. Okay, now you're saying, well, big deal. How does that help us? Well, listen, 50 billion people in the world, we can start deducing down to that town. And now, you know, we have all these potential suspects in this town. We can now deduce it to somebody who likes to go out and party, was partying, um, 
And I'll go further, but we'll, let's start there. It was somebody at one of those parties. Now, somebody went back to her house. Now, we have to determine whether she brought them back or they drove back. I am going to assume that they, they followed her back. Now, why? Because her body has to get to that dump site somehow. It didn't just miraculously fall out of the air there. And her car is parked at her house. So her car was not used to transport her body. Now, again, some people will say, well, it could, you know, they could transport it and then, no, it didn't happen. So more than likely, somebody drove. So now we can deduce even further, right? It was somebody at those parties, one of those parties. It was a group of at least two who had a car. So see how we, although it seems very mundane, it's how you start deducing your suspect pool. Now we're going to continue to deduce that suspect pool until we can, can no longer deduce and our suspects will be within that group and that's where you have to start your investigation. Now remember when I said that the the drug use and Donna not telling her date that that was laced with PCP. I believe I read that Donna was staying or she had a girlfriend that was staying with her there while her parents were gone and I didn't get enough about her so it seemed like she was a non non-witness she wasn't very important to the investigation it seems Meaning she probably, did, she was out on a date, sp spent the night at her boyfriend's house, who knows. But one of the things that I did read that is very telling is that she, she Donna kept that PCP, the marijuana, laced with PCP, in a, a shoe of some sort or somewhere. I can't remember where. A shoe sticks out to me. And when she told police this, police looked and that wasn't there. I just, I don't like going with hunches without evidence to back things up, even circumstantial evidence or, you know, indirect evidence. But sometimes past behavior will show you, you know, answer your questions for future results. Meaning, I think it's very possible, if not probable, that Donna brought trouble into her house, not knowing it was trouble, and maybe it wasn't trouble. Maybe there was nothing nefarious at the time. But she gave this marijuana to smoke for everybody to smoke. Maybe she didn't tell them that it was PCP because she had done it just a couple hours earlier. For what reason, I don't know. I don't know why she would do that. Now, it's quite possible she told everybody, hey, I got some marijuana at the house. It's laced with PCP. You want to come? Yeah. But I just have a hard time with that. PCP affects people differently and aggressively. And when I look at the crime scene, when I when I envision the crime scene, because I didn't look at any of the pictures, but I do see the wounds and the brutality, the number of wounds, I, I think that the PCP may have played a role in the death of Donna Dustin. Now, it is certainly possible, if not probable, that Donna was sexually assaulted or that that led to her demise along with the PCP. Because when people are on this drug, they do not act rationally. They hallucinate. They can see things. 
And if the, it was given to somebody without their knowledge, and then it was like, oh, yeah, this has PCP in it, it would make you very angry, right? But that's not the type of murder this is. Remember, we've deduced already it is a sexual type of murder. But it doesn't mean that the PCP didn't play a role in it. Maybe a secondary role, but a role nonetheless. So, the type of person, the offender, that we're looking for is a leader. A leader of younger, more than likely, people. Let me explain further. You're looking for somebody who is probably in their upper teens, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, maybe even 24 years old, in that group, okay? Could be like an older offender, 24, who still hangs out and parties with the younger groups. But because he's older, he is a leader. He may not be a leader to the community, but to these type of kids, teenagers, he's a leader. He's older. The younger kids, some of them that are in his crew, look up to him. He is the person who is responsible for this murder. He is the person who this potential sexual interlude happened with and when it went wrong it went south it was okay to begin an assault on her and telling his other friend probably two friends to help whether whether donna was stabbed pre or post-mortem or anti-mortem meaning she was in the throes of death. That I don't know because I don't have enough information on that. I would, from my experience at looking at all these cases that I have, I would bet that they were probably post-mortem stab wounds. Meaning, the leader is telling his guys, You're, you were here, you witnessed this, she affected us all. We're all going to get our hands dirty. You're going to go over there and stab her. This is a very unique case, and it's a unique set of circumstances um, because of multiple people being involved. And I got to be honest when I say I, those are difficult. But what you can ascertain from that is that one of them is normally the alpha dog and the other one is subservient in some type of way and will listen, whether it's out of fright or whether it's out of respect. But that is what, what I see from what I know from listening to investigators and reading the crime scene, that's what it tells me. That's what I see has happened here. It is, it is possible that she was killed, let's say, at another location and brought to that abandoned gravel pit. Sure. But let me tell you the problem I have with that theory. If she was killed, let's say, in another house, or let's say it was her house, she's in a bedroom, sexual assault's taking place, or maybe it's consensual. I mean, you, you have to look at that as well. You can't automatically say that these people sexually assaulted her. Could have started out consensual. Why? Because look at her victimology. 
we know that she just had sex with this guy on her first date. That's not victim shaming. I would, I never do that. That's victimology and those are facts. So, but what wouldn't happen is if they killed her in her bedroom naked. Number one, if it was in her house, they're just going to leave her there. Okay. They didn't take time to conceal her body. They didn't dig a grave. They didn't place anything over top of her. They took her to an abandoned pit that is known to be like a party spot. So it isn't like they are saying, hey, she won't be found there. No, they know she's going to be found. Maybe not nine o'clock in the morning. Maybe they weren't expecting that, but she was going to be found. And maybe they wanted her to be found. So number one, if they, she was killed in her house, they would have just left her there. And they would have gotten their car and they would have left. But that didn't happen. Number two, when somebody is naked, they more often than not are never transported naked. Okay, meaning they are either clothed, they're wrapped up in something. You don't want to just be carrying a naked body out into your car, especially where Donna lived. She had neighbors. So it didn't happen there, and it probably didn't happen at another house. Um, unless it was one of the suspects' homes, and they had to remove the body. Now, that's a big leap, but... That's possible. What if, and again, this goes back to being an investigator on the scene, I would look in the refrigerator. Is there any more beer there? Because if they were out of beer and they still wanted to continue to drink and party, then I could see them leaving Donna's home and all getting in one car because there's no sense taking two cars. Okay, hey, get in with us. We'll drive. We'll go get more beer. And maybe there was no place to get any other beer. So where did they go? I mean, they just went to the abandoned gravel pit and got aggressive right there in the car with two or three guys on PCP, drunk. She says no. Gets out of hand. The alpha dog, the alpha male, is initiating things, he's angry, he kills her. He kills her alone. He bashes her head in. The other guys are not actively participating, maybe. I don't know this for sure, but I would surmise based off of my experience that that's how this went down. And then the others just helped got their hands dirty, listened to the alpha male as to what happened. And that lug wrench being forcibly inserted into her vagina is like the final F you. You don't turn me down. I turn you down. Okay? Now, I could be completely wrong, and there's probably some things in this assessment that are certainly not right, but... The totality of everything, that's what it looks like to me, folks. That's what I see here. Now, how will this case ever be solved? Well, I told you back at the beginning of this, you know, were the cigarette butts. If there were cigarette butts, were they saved? How about those, those beer cans? Probably not. Maybe they were because you certainly would have ran them, you know, latent prints, um, and tested them, I would hope. So maybe they're still in evidence. They can definitely be tested for DNA. You would swab just the tops of them. I got a DNA swab off of a can in a murder, a double murder, once after 25 years. So it happens, you know, if they save those things. Her clothing being missing, I think, is key because her clothing is not taken as a trophy. The clothing is taken to get rid of. And more than likely, I think that those clothing was in a car. Okay? And more than likely, right there at that gravel pit, it's a party spot. Now, remember the time frame. You're talking 1.30 in the morning is when this all started, meaning 
her party in, going to a party, back to her house to drink some more. I mean, you can start narrowing down that time frame to, let's say, 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning. People are starting to go home, okay? People, it's cold. People are not going to be at 4 in the morning out at that gravel pit drinking. Now, they might, yes. I'm, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but maybe they went there to that, to do that, and nothing was there. And they just stayed there. And, you know, I, I don't think that this was premeditated. I think it was, you know, this is not some sort of uh, serial sexual offender. It was something that got out of hand. A lot of guys, in a lot of cases that I've seen where... It is Jennifer Hill case, once again. The crime scene looks sexual in nature, right? Because a shirt's pulled up or her pants are pulled down. And sex is definitely a, a, a part of that. It is, it is a component of why the victim is dead, but it isn't the reason like in the Jennifer Hill case. You know, he took her back there for sexual purposes, okay? But he's not a sexual offender, meaning he's not a, he's not a serial rapist, he's not a serial killer. Yeah, he took her back there for that purpose, but because she said no, it angered him. And the rage took over, okay? Fast forward to this, Yes, this is a sexually motivated crime, meaning there was a, there's a component of sex to it. But he is, it's not a premeditated sexual assault uh, murder. It's rage. You said no, I'm going to sh show you. You don't tease me. I see that a lot. And I see that here. So, now, this assessment like many, could change if different evidence is shown to me. Uh, but from what I see, what was given to me, what these investigators said to us, that's my assessment on the Donna Dustin case from Bowie, Maryland. It's a shame. There's a lot of people that care. I think the offenders um, were... A, Rough bunch at the time, drinkers, probably uh, violent, meaning fighters, potential sociopath in the aspect of not having empathy, at least one of them, the alpha dog more than likely. And I think the best scenario besides potential evidence in solving this case is the secondary people that were there. The ones that may have stabbed her after she was dead, post-mortem. Hit her with the brick and rock. Uh, I think they have the potential to come forward now that they are older. And they probably never told anybody this. And they want to get it off their shoulders. And that is because they got kids of their own now. And they look, the view of the world is different now than when it was when they were 19 when this happened. So because of that, I think there's good potential that this case could be solved if the evidence it was handled properly or one of those secondary figures, suspects, offenders, comes forward and says, you know what, I can't live with this anymore. This is what happened. And I think that is what's hopefully going to happen in this case. It will be solved. Somebody will come forward and Donna, Dustin, and her family will get the resolution that they so deserve. I want to give a special thanks to Renee who went out and got these interviews. He worked tire tirelessly uh, to help get this all together. The investigators, the private investigators, the former law enforcement, the family, 
all those people that, that came forward to give information to help this episode of Exit Unsolved come to fruition. I humbly thank you. It's people like you who care and who won't let these cases die. It's because of you these cases will have resolution. So thank you for watching this edition of Exit Unsolved with Ken Mates. And he's out. Move the thin ghost of music in the spinet. I cannot say your speed, I cannot wander your hill lands, or your cornlands, or your valleys ever again, nor share the battle yonder where the young knight, the broken squadron, rallies. Only sit quiet while my mind remembers the beauty of fire from the beauty of embers. <laughs>